our life, our experience, our genes, the societies in which we are. So, to argue that we are determined by our genes without actually understanding that our genes are meaningless except in the context of the cells in which they are embedded, the bodies in which those cells are, exist, the societies in which those bodies actually grow up, and the ways in which we transform continuously those societies as we grow, as we grow and change the world around us, is not is in a sense to fundamentally misunderstand the nature of what it is to be a biosocial organism that we are. And a genuine biosocial science which would put all of these things together and enable us to understand how we exist in the context of the world. That is the sort of science that we need to aim for in this context. And it's one which does not reduce us to our genes and it cannot reduce us entirely just to our evolutionary history in the way that the evolutionary psychologists and the sociobiologists want to obtain. That is, again, we cannot understand who we are without understanding not just our biology, but the society, the culture, the past, and the future. Now let me turn, in the last few minutes, to the third part of the story. The third part of the story is the claim that because of the technological advances that have taken place, the biotechnological advances over the course of the last 20 or 30 years, since um, not just the discovery of the DNA double helix, but above all, since the um, capacity to manipulate genes, to take genes in and out, to create organisms which have transformed genes and so on, the belief that the future of um, creating a new and better world and solving human diseases lies in manipulating genes. Of course, yes, in some measure it does. I don't want to underrate for one moment the power and significance of the biotechnological transformations that are going on around us. But I do want to say this. Biotechnology and genetic engineering has been promising for the last 30, or 30 years, 25 years certainly, that they would transform the way they live, we would live, that GM would produce the sorts of food that we need at low cost and, that we, and, 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 and transform our agriculture that genetic engineering would cure human diseases. When the Human Genome pro Project, the decoding of the entire 3, 000, um, 3, 3 billion base pairs that constitute the human genome, when that first draft was of the human genome was completed in the early part of this millennium, and some of you remember Bill Clinton and Tony Blair sharing a press conference with the public and private sectors who had actually done the decoding, and this capacity to pull, up, pull out from, your, hand, from, from the, your back pocket a floppy disk and say that in a little while we'll be able to have your entire genome, the book of life, encoded on the floppy disk in this sort of way. You'll know your future, you'll know the diseases, you'll know who you'll have sex with, you'll know what your children will look like, you'll know what the world will be like for you in 20, 30 or 40 years' time. That was promise, that was hype. And the reason why it was promise and hype is not just that the biotech industry hasn't become an industry worth many, many billions of dollars and pounds over the last decades, it has. But the many, many billions of dollars and pounds which have been invested in it, into it has produced so far what? By way of transforming human health and happiness, by way of curing disease. We're better at diagnosing your risk for diseases I could diagnose you, anyone in this room now um, with the appropriate genetic test and say, well, you had a 5% greater or lesser chance of getting Alzheimer's disease by the time you were my age. Um, what good would that do you? We've no treatments. We've no cure. No single cure or treatment has yet come out of the genetic engineering industry over this entire period of time. The promises are still there. That's, of course, why now people are promising stem cells instead of genetic engineering. But it's important to recognize why there has been this failure, why nothing has yet come out of it. And why nothing has yet come out of it is because it rests on a systematic mistake, a systematic misunderstanding of the relationship between a gene and the animal or person that that gene is embedded in. The assumption that you can take one gene out, put one gene in, out of the, the 25,000 genes that you've got in your body, and that you will therefore get one outcome from it, 
there is one gene, one disease, is a, is a nonsensical statement. It is a nonsensical statement genetically and biologically. It is a nonsensical statement because genes don't exist in isolation. Genes are part of a genome. Genes are part of the 25,000 genes that you have in your body. Those are embedded in the 3 billion base pairs that you have, in your, you, you have in the whole of your genome. And all of them are embedded in the cells in your body. From the moment of conception, the fusion of egg and sperm, to the creation of any single one of us in an adult, you get from those 25,000 genes, um, 100,000 different proteins, 100 trillion different cells in your body, 100 billion different nerve cells in your brain, 100 trillion different connections between those nerve cells in the brain. This combinatorial explosion, as you move from genes to, or to cells, from cells to structures, from structures to people, and I'm not yet coming to society, and I will do before I'm finished, um, is one which actually explains why you cannot simply regard a single gene as doing a particular job. What we have to understand, once again, is that, we, that any living organism creates itself out of the raw material which is given by our genes and our environment. And it is not enough just to think about genes in a particular context in order to try to understand what it is that has gone wrong in a particular disease. Sure, there can be faulty genes. Sure, there can be a gene that actually goes awry. And sure, for certain, there are some diseases that we have which are directly associated with one abnormal gene or two or three abnormal genes. Though the more you look at any of those, the more complicated it appears. But the overwhelming majority of conditions to which we, which, uh, in terms of diseases and treatments, are the result of the interactions of many, many genes and many, many cells over the entire developmental sequence. And this is, again, something that the Promethean view of genetics as dealing with tinkering with individual genes cannot enable people to understand. And that is, in a sense, where a good bit of the genetic engineering and the biotechnology trade has gone wrong. And, of course, sensible geneticists and sensible biologists actually recognize it, that's why, we've actually, that's why there's been a move away from thinking about single genes. There's been a move to think instead about complexity, about all the hundred different thousand different proteins there are in your body. So instead of genes, we have genomics. Instead of proteins, we have proteomics. We have this immense complexity in which, in, in, in which an organism is supposed to develop. And complexity is important. Complexity is indeed important. We have, as I again insist, to remember the embeddedness of genes in genomes, genomes in cells, cells in organisms, and organisms in society. So let me come to the society bit finally. The crucial thing, it seems to me, that people do not understand if you think about genetic treatments for diseases is that the overwhelming majority of diseases and problems that we face in the world today, looking at the world as a whole, are not to do with genes, <laughs> They're to do with poverty, they're to do with capitalism, they're to do with imperialism, they're to do with the distribution of labor, they're to do with the distribution of resources between the rich and the poor. The emphasis on molecular medicine, the emphasis on genes going wrong, is a way of taking attention away from the fundamental issues of inequalities in health and disease, even in Britain today. When you learn, even in Britain today, that the death rate of babies in Bradford and in certain sub areas of Liverpool is four or five times higher than the death rate of babies in Cambridge and regions of London, avoidable deaths because of maldistribution of resources. And yet at the same time, we find a government which is committed to investing in molecular medicine rather than in public health. You see that it's not just the biology which is misunderstood.